In this lecture, we show how to get a pipe to replace the standard input and output. And we look closely also at EOF issues uh, on pipes. Now, as we saw in the prior segment, the read and write file descriptors for the pipe are 3 and 4. But what if we wanted to read from the pipe as standard input, say using scanf, and write as standard output, perhaps using printf to write to the pipe? This would automatically happen if file descriptors 0 and 1 were returned from the pipe call instead of 3 and 4. In question 1 here, be sure you recall why that's so. How would scanf and printf know to read and write the pipe in that case? Coming back from a pause, recall of course that the global data standard in and standard out file pointer objects used by scanf and printf respectively are initialized to work on file descriptors 0 and 1 automatically. So whatever those two file descriptors refer to, that's what scanf and printf will use. Now, we can't change what pipe returns, but we can move or copy one file descriptor to another using the dupe2 system call. Line 15 here shows an example. Dupe2 takes two file descriptors as parameters, and it copies the first into the second. In the line 15 call, we get FD0, which is 3 in our case, copied into FD0, so that they both refer to the same quote-unquote file. In this case, that's the read end of the pipe. Whatever FD0 was referring to, perhaps the keyboard or a redirected input file, is closed. So after the dupe2 call, reads from either FD3 or FD0 will take their data from the pipe as you can see in the diagram, where we'll lay out here a table of the FDs and what they refer to. Note that uh, this does mean that two separate FDs, 0 and 3 for example, uh, can refer to the same source of data, whether it's a pipe or a file or what have you. If we don't want two FDs open for reading the pipe, then we need the close on line 16, which would close FD3 so that the second arrow here no longer applies. Here's question two. The idea that two file descriptors might refer to exactly the same thing really shouldn't be surprising. We've seen it before. Indeed, it happens in most programs. Where is that? Back from a pause. Recall that file descriptors 1 and 2 often refer to the same thing, say the screen. One is used for standard output and the other for standard error, but they may both go to the same destination. Now the two call combination on lines 15 and 16 is a, a sort of idiom for change or move one file descriptor to another instead. We'll do the uh, same down here on lines uh, 18 and 19 for the pipe writing file descriptor moving it to FD1. So diagrammatically we start with 4 being open for writing to the pipe and then we end up with, uh, let's see what it would be, uh, a dupe 2 for uh, 1 being open to the pipe and then of course we close the uh, four, and we end up with just the one open to the pipe. Now, as a result of all of this, the line 22 printf, or 21, I'm sorry, printf here, writes talking to myself into the pipe. And this is the effect we'll get. And then the uh, line 22 fgetS call, um, right there, reads that back out of the pipe and returns the buffer uh, as the result of fgetS to be printed by fprintf to standard error. And you can see the result down here, of course. You got uh, first the reading uh, dot 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 and then talking to myself. 
By the way, here's question three. Uh, why did we write that to standard error instead of just doing a normal printf? And coming back from a pause, it really is obvious when you think about it. Uh, writing to standard out would have fed the string right back into the pipe. Remember, we've got the thing redirected to the pipe, and we wouldn't have seen it on screen. At this point, the only data going to the screen at all is, is what's written on standard error. Now, recall, by the way, from earlier topics, that standard error is for exactly this purpose, sending text to screen when standard out has been redirected. The prior segment gave some exact rules for EOF detection on pipes. Uh, be sure you understood those. Uh, with them in mind, uh, after a, re a review if necessary, uh, let's look at how EOF works in our example. Now, lines 23 through 24 are a commented out effort to uh, read past the end of the data in the pipe and thus reach EOF. There. Recall, by the way, from prior coursework that fgetS returns null if we read past EOF. And recall also that the FEOF function never returns true unless you've tried to read past EOF, not just up to it. So we do need that fgetS to get past EOF. Uh, we really can't tell we've hit EOF until an underlying read call returns zero bytes, right? So it makes sense then that before testing for EOF on line 25, we do another fgetS call as on line 23. But I had to comment out lines 23 through 24. Why is that? What bad thing happens if we actually run them? Reason this out carefully from the pipe EOF logic from the prior segment. It's probably the most important question of this segment. So coming back from a pause, the program will deadlock because that line 23 fgetS will do a read call on the pipe and there is no data presently in the pipe but there is still a writer on the pipe our standard out of course so the read will block and the program will be left there waiting forever for the one remaining writer us but we're blocked on the pipe to write data to it or to close it so the read can either return data or a zero now, you don't normally run pipes to yourself, but this kind of deadlock on pipes is still common even when other processes are the writers. It's really easy to set up a situation where one process has a forgotten open file descriptor on a pipe and ignores it, neither writing to it nor closing it. Other processes reading the pipe end up hanging, waiting for that one negligent process to make up its mind. As we start adding new processes to the pipe discussion in upcoming segments, will be painfully careful to track all open writers to a pipe and close them when we don't want them. Okay, so now we can see why lines 25 through 26, as you can see down here in the output on line 41, uh, lines 25 through 26 do not yet detect an EOF. Line 28 does the all-important fclose call, and then we can try reading past EOF getting null and successfully checking for EOF on lines 32 through 33. And as you can see, we do get EOF at that point. Could we have omitted lines 29 through 30 here and still gotten true from FEOF on line 33? It's a question and coming back from a pause on it. No, this is basically a reality check on what we just did a moment ago. It's a standard I.O. library issue. The library cannot determine EOF on a stream until a read call has actually returned zero. And if all we've seen so far are successful reads, even if the next read is sure to return zero, we don't know that until we actually try it. In other words, we have to read through EOF, not just up to EOF, in order to detect EOF. In the next segment, we'll do a fork on a process that has a pipe open and see how we can get two different processes working on the same pipe.